Section 8 of Your Mind and How to Use It by William Walker Atkinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 The Role of the Emotions. The average person greatly underestimates the part played by the emotional nature in the mental activities of the individual. He is inclined to the opinion that, with the exception of the occasional manifestation of some strong emotional feeling, the majority of persons go through life using only the reasoning and reflective faculties in deciding the problems of life and guiding the mental course of action. There can be no greater mistake concerning the mental activities. So far from being subordinate to the intellect, the emotional nature, in the majority of cases, dominates the reasoning faculties. There are but very few persons who are able to detach themselves, even in a small degree, from the feelings and to decide questions cold-bloodedly by pure reason or intellectual effort. Moreover, there are but few persons whose wills are guided by pure reason. The feelings supply the motive for the majority of acts of will. The intellect, even when used, is generally employed to better carry out the dictates of feeling and desire. Much of our reasoning is performed in order to justify our feelings or to find proofs for the position dictated by our desires, feelings, sympathies, prejudices, or sentiments. It has been said that men seek not reasons, but excuses for their actions. Moreover, in the elementary processes of the intellect, the emotions play an important part. We have seen that attention largely follows interest, and interest follows from feeling. Therefore, our attention, and that which arises from it, is dependent largely upon the feelings. Thus, feeling asserts its power in guarding the very outer gate of knowledge, and determines largely what shall or shall not enter therein. It is one of the constantly appearing paradoxes of psychology, that while feelings have originally arisen from attention, it is equally true that attention depends largely upon the interest resulting from the feelings. This is readily admitted in the case of involuntary attention, which always goes out toward objects of interest and feeling, but is likewise true of even voluntary attention, which we direct to something of greater or more nearly ultimate interest than the things of lesser or more immediate interest. Sully says, by an act of will, I may resolve to turn my attention to something, say, a passage in a book. But if, after the preliminary processes of adjustment of the mental eye, the object opens up no interesting phase, all the willing in the world will not produce a calm, settled state of concentration. The will introduces mind and object. It cannot force an attachment between them. No compulsion of attention ever succeeded in making a young child cordially embrace and appropriate, by an act of concentration, an unsuitable and therefore uninteresting object. We thus see that even voluntary interest is not removed from the sway of interest. What the will does is to determine the kind of interest that shall prevail at the moment. Again, we may see that memory is largely dependent upon interest in recording and recalling its impressions. We remember and recall most easily that which most greatly interests us. In proportion to the lack of interest in a thing, do we find difficulty in remembering or recalling it. This is equally true of the imagination, for it refuses to dwell upon that which is not interesting. Even in the reasoning processes, we find the will balking at uninteresting subjects, but galloping along, pushing before it the rolling chair of interesting intellectual application. Our judgments are affected by our feelings. It is much easier to approve of the actions of some person we like, or whose views accord with our own, than of an individual whose personality and views are distasteful to us. It is very difficult to prevent prejudice, for or against, from influencing our judgments. It is also true that we find that for which we look in things and persons and that which we expect and look for is often dependent upon our feelings. If we dislike a person or thing, we are usually able to perceive no end of undesirable things in him or it, while if we are favourably inclined, we easily find many admirable qualities in the same person or thing. A little change in our feeling often results in the formation of an entirely new set of judgments regarding a person or thing. Halleck well says, 
On the one hand, the emotions are favourable to intellectual action, since they supply the interest one feels in study. One may feel intensely concerning a certain subject and be all the better student. Hence the emotions are not, as was formerly thought, entirely hostile to intellectual action. Emotion often quickens the perception, burns things indelibly into the memory, and doubles the rapidity of thought. On the other hand, strong feelings often vitiate every operation of the intellect. They cause us to see only what we wish to, to remember only what interests our narrow feeling at the time, and to reason from selfish data only. Emotion puts the magnifying end of the telescope to our intellectual eyes where our own interests are concerned, the minimizing end when we are looking at the interest of others. Thought is deflected when it passes through an emotional medium, just as a sunbeam is when it strikes water. As for the will, the best authorities hold that it is almost, if not entirely, dependent upon desire for its motive force. As desire is an outgrowth and development of feeling and emotion, it is seen that even the will depends upon feeling for its inciting motives and its direction. We shall consider this point at greater detail in the chapters devoted to the activities of the will. We would remind you again, at this point, of the great triangle of the mind, the emotional, ideative and volitional activities, feeling, thinking and willing, and their constant reaction upon each other and absolute interdependence. We find that our feelings arise from previous willing and ideation, and are aroused by ideas and repressed by will. Again we see that our ideas are largely dependent upon the interest supplied by our feelings, and that our judgments are influenced by the emotive side of our mental life, the will also having its part to play in the matter. We also see that the will is called into activity by the feelings, and often guided or restrained by our thoughts, the will indeed being considered as moved entirely by our feelings and ideas. Thus is the trinity of mental forces seen ever in mutual relation, constant action and reaction ever existing between them. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 The Emotions and Happiness Happiness has been defined by an authority as the pleasurable emotion arising from the gratification of all desires, the enjoyment of pleasure without pain. Another has said that happiness is the state in which all desires are satisfied. But these definitions have been attacked. It is held by many that a state of absolute satisfaction of desire would not be happiness, for happiness consists largely in pleasurable anticipation and imaginings which disappear upon the realization of the desire. It is held that absolute satisfaction would be a negative state. Paley expressed a better idea when he said that any condition may be denominated happy in which the amount or aggregate of pleasure exceeds that of pain, and the degree of happiness depends upon the quantity of this excess. Some have held that an existing contrast between pain and pleasure, the balance being in favour of the latter, is necessary to establish happiness. Be this as it may, it is admitted by all that one's happiness, or unhappiness, depends entirely upon one's emotional nature and the degree of the satisfaction thereof. And it is generally admitted that to be happy is the great aim and object of the life of the majority of persons, if, indeed, not of every person, the happiness, of course, depending on the quality and degree of the emotions forming the person's emotional nature. Thus it is seen that we are dependent upon the emotional side of our mental life in this, as in nearly everything else, making life worth while. Theologians have often sought to point out that happiness is not the goal of life and living, but human nature has always insisted that happiness is the greatest end and philosophy has generally supported it. But wisdom shows that happiness is not always dependent upon the pleasure of the moment, for the sacrifice of immediate pleasure frequently results in a much greater happiness in the future. In the same way, an immediate disagreeable task often gains for us a greater satisfaction in the future. Likewise, it is frequently greater happiness to sacrifice a personal pleasure for the happiness of others, than it would be to enjoy the pleasure of the moment at the expense of the pain of the other. 
there is often a far greater pleasure resulting from an altruistic action of self-sacrifice than in the performance of the selfish egoistic act but as the subtle reasoner may insist the result is the same the ultimate happiness and satisfaction of the self this conclusion does not rob the altruistic act of its virtue however for the person who finds his greatest pleasure in giving pleasure to others is to be congratulated as is the community which shelters him there is no virtue in pain suffering sacrifice or unhappiness for its own sake this illusion of asceticism is vanishing from the human mind sacrifice on the part of the individual is valuable and valid only when it results in higher present or future happiness for the individual or someone else there is no virtue in pain physical or mental except as a step to a greater good for ourselves or others pain at the best is merely nature's alarm and warning of not this way it is also held that pain serves to bring out pleasure by contrast and is therefore valuable in this way be this as it may no normal individual deliberately seeks ultimate pain in preference to ultimate happiness the greatest ultimate happiness to oneself and to those he loves is the normal and natural goal of the normal person but the concept of those he loves in many cases includes the race as well as the immediate family wisdom shows the individual that the greatest happiness comes to him who controls and restrains many of his feelings dissipation results in pain and unhappiness ultimately the doctrine of thoughtless indulgence is unphilosophical and is contradicted by the experience of the race moreover wisdom shows that the highest happiness comes not from the indulgence of the physical feelings alone or to excess but rather from the cultivation development and manifestation of the higher feelings the social aesthetic and intellectual emotions the higher pleasures of life literature art music science invention constructive imagination etc yield a satisfaction and happiness keener and more enduring than can possibly the lower forms of feeling but the human being must not despise any part of his emotional being everything has its uses which are good and its abuses which are bad every part of one's being mental and physical is well to use but no part is well used if it uses the individual instead of being itself used a recent writer has held that the end and aim of life should not be the pursuit of happiness but rather the building of character the obvious answer is that the two are identical in spirit for to the man who appreciates the value of character its attainment is the greatest happiness the wise teach that the greatest happiness comes to him who is possessed of a well-rounded developed character another writer has said that the aim of life should be self-improvement with a due regard to the interest of others this is but saying that the greatest happiness to the wise man lies in this course anyone who is wise enough or great enough to make these ends the aim and goal of his life will find the greatest happiness therefrom arnold bennett advances as a good working philosophy of life cheerfulness kindliness and rectitude can anyone doubt that this course would bring great ultimate happiness happiness consists in that which contents the spirit and the latter it depends entirely upon the character of the feelings and emotions entertained by one as weighed in the balance of reason and as passed upon by judgment and the sense of right action the greatest degree of happiness or at least the greatest ratio of pleasure over pain is obtained by a careful and intelligent cultivation of the feeling side of one's being in connection with the cultivation of the intellect and the mastery of the will to be able to bring the capacity for enjoyment to its highest to be able to intelligently choose that which will bring the greatest ultimate happiness in accordance with right action and finally to be able to use the will in the direction of holding fast to that which is good and rejecting that which is bad this is the power of creating happiness the feelings the intellect and the will here as ever combine to manifest the result 
Finally, it must be remembered that all human happiness consists in part of the ability to bear pain, to suffer. There must be the dash of stoicism in the wise Epicurean. One must learn to pluck from pain, suffering and unhappiness the secret drop of honey which lies at its heart, and which consists in the knowledge of the meaning and use of pain, and the means whereby it may be transmuted into knowledge and experience, from which later happiness may be distilled. To profit by pain, to transmute suffering into joy, to transform present unhappiness into a future greater happiness, this is the privilege of the philosopher. The mental states and activities known as desire are a direct development of the feeling and emotional phase of the mind, and form the motive power of the will. Desire, in fact, may be said to be composed of feeling on one side and will on the other. But the influence of the intellect or reasoning faculties has a most important part to play in the evolution of feeling into desire and in the consequent action of the will by the presentation and weighing of conflicting desires. Therefore, the logical place for the consideration of the activities of the intellect is at this point, between emotion and will. Accordingly, we shall leave the subject of feeling and emotion for the present, to be taken up again in connection with the subject of desire, after we have considered the intellectual processes of the mind. But, as has been indicated, we shall see the presence and influence of the feelings and emotions even in the activities of the intellect. End of chapter 19 End of section 8